When I first started playing League of Legends, the best thing that helped me improve right away was having friends there that I could answer my questions, I could ask them anything, and they would know the answer. Ghostu AI is a brand new AI assistant that will help gamers win more. It's a gaming buddy that tracks the game progress and suggests the best strategies and tactics to help you win more. It will boost your confidence as a player and it will entertain you along the way. It's a voice and a chat interface that feels like a friend. You can get so much advice from your personal voice assistant, like what items to buy, which skills should I level up, where should I be placing wards, and how can I lane better. Ghostu Assistant knows all the answers. Win more with their voice assistant today and check the link in the description down below to sign up. It's no secret that competitive play in League of Legends, the game that the pros play, is entirely different than solo queue ranked that all of us scrubs play. By analyzing which champions are played at the highest level, you would notice an interesting trend. One type of champion, one class of champion, has always struggled to make its way into competitive play, which is the melee carry. This is a specific type of melee champion though. These are not the Rivens, Aurelias, or even current Fiora. No, these are different types of champions. These are the Master Yis, Trindamirs, and Yasuos. And I think Yasuo is the only exception of a melee carry that is truly usable at the highest level, unless you count Gangplank, but even then he's kind of partially ranged. These champions are not about being a bruiser, a hybrid of damage and tankiness with Black Cleaver in Death's Dance. Rather, this is about damage, and a lot of it. This is about a champion who would rather build 6 infinity edges than be caught dead building even one tank item. Good is relative, overpowered is relative, being terrible is relative, but bad design? Is that relative to all of the other champions too? Or is it objective? Are melee carries objectively poorly designed in this game? That is hard to say, and I will leave that up to you to discuss. But without a doubt, there is one melee carry who was poorly designed. A champion so bad at the highest level, according to Game of Legends, she was never picked in competitive play. Not even one time. This is the story of one of League of Legends' forgotten fighters, named Fiora. Looking at the champions released before February 29th, 2012, one trend that you will notice is that all of the true melee carries like Master Yi, Trindamir, and Nocturne were all male champions. And while it's true, like we said, we did have a few fighters like Aurelia and Riven who are female, no true carries. Fiora's design was around being specifically the first melee carry female, one who would not opt for health, resistances, and items to help you stay in the fight for a long time, but instead be Master Yi's 1v5 sidekick. Her time would come on Leap Day, February 29th, 2012, and from the champion spotlight, Riot hits pretty hard at how aggressive the champion was supposed to be, with the recommended items being completely damage-oriented. Overall, she was pretty hyped coming into her release, with one article on Engadget.com noting how there's been a huge influx of mage champions at the time, and it was getting a bit stale, so a true melee carry would spice things up. We also had articles on PC Gamer and a roundtable discussing League's newest champion. From the very beginning, there was hope. But unfortunately, sometimes in life, hope is not enough, because Fiora sucked. Generally speaking, Fiora was just underwhelming. Balance and power is relative, like we said. For example, I don't necessarily think that Master Yi is that good of a champion right now, but if Riot removed all hard CC from the entire game, well, you know what? He might literally become the best champ in the game. It's important to compare League of Legends champions to one another because it matters a lot. This is not a PvE game mode. You always have to fight against other champions. It's not really a game where you're just fighting Baron one-on-one. -on -one. 
With Fiora, by just looking at her kit, it doesn't look so bad at first. Her passive was pretty nice, helping her out giving her sustain. Her Q did help you chase down people because you got to use it twice, and her Riposte blocked an auto attack and dealt some damage back to them, as shown in the champion spotlight against a champion like Nasus. If you block his Q, it's pretty favorable for her. Finally, her E gave her a nice steroid, plus the phage passive, which allowed you to run people down. However, this is superficial. League of Legends games are not won on paper, they are not won in the numbers, but rather in execution. And when looking at champions who fulfilled similar niches to Fiora, it's no competition. Her ultimate was her only saving grace. This ability was extremely good and iconic for the old Fiora. There was even a bug with Tiamat that made this ability let her single-handedly win games, but we will get back to that in a bit. For her passive, the numbers were extremely low, and even though it was a solid idea for her passive, in general it's pretty boring because the healing wasn't comparable anyway to other sustain abilities in the game, so it was written off as mediocre. Her riposte, again, although super cool in theory because of the nature of fencing and being a duelist, was unfortunately completely outclassed by other champions' defensive abilities. Jax's Counter-Strike does damage too, but also stuns people and block all autos for a few seconds, not just one auto. Obviously, champions like Trindamir also have insane ultimates, effectively making him infinitely tanky for a few seconds. Master Yi could go untargetable on a basic ability that also resets its cooldown, and his Meditate has always been underrated for a defensive ability because when it's used properly, it negates a lot of damage. Yasuo has a passive shield, and a wind wall, and hard CC. And of course, Nocturne has a spell shield, and his built-in passive sustain was much stronger, and he has hard CC with his fear. For Fiora, her E felt lame. Although the movement speed was pretty good, and the attack speed was awesome, it didn't last for very long. One thing that I will say is that during that short period of time that you did activate your E, Fiora had to have been one of the fastest tower killers in the game. It gave upwards of 120% bonus attack speed, and I remember this being one of the parts that I loved about her kit. You would turn on E and melt towers. One thing that also went under the radar during the time is how strong her early game was. I mean very early levels, like 1 to 3 because of the insane passive AD that you got from your W. Riposte gave you 15 AD at level 1. It didn't scale that well, only up to 35 when you maxed it, but she would have almost 100 AD at level 3 when her opponents would be somewhere in the 70s or 80s, and that added up to be a lot on auto attacks. As we said, the shining part of her kit was her ultimate, and to be honest, it was straight up OP. There was nothing wrong with it, it was a really good ability. The best part about it is that it applied on hit effects, such as Black Cleaver's Armor Shred and even Lifesteal. Turns out, players would take this one step further and theorycraft and ask themselves, okay, what about Tiamat? When you think about press R type champions in League of Legends, you know those ones that pop off by just pressing one button? You didn't have to look any further than Tiamat stacking Fiora. You see, Tiamat used to work differently than it does now because it allowed the passive, which is the cleave effect, to stack up multiple times the more Tiamats that you got. I don't know if this was a bug, or it was intended, but the point is, it worked. And it was ridiculously good on champions like Twitch when he pressed R. Yeah, it, it worked on ranged champions, you heard me right. But there's also a famous clip of Wings of Death doing it on Shivana to completely one-shot pen to kill the enemy team. However, no other champion synergized that well with Tiamat stacking the same way Fiora did. It was famously OP for her. Back in 2014, GBay99 released a video called The Fiora Effect, and he outlines an effect that he describes as being okay or not too bad for solo queue, but absolutely terrible for competitive play. As he continues on, he notes that Fiora can still snowball if you get going with a few kills, and because of her massively impactful ultimate, nothing could stop her if she got a lead. If you get snowballing, you can still win games. But because of her lack of any crowd control, mobility that was only just okay on her Q, but nothing special, and a lackluster passive in E, she will never be utilized by any pro players. And you know what? He wasn't exaggerating either. For Fiora, when she was released in 2012, if you look at Game of Legends, they do not have a single game listed. There is no data for Fiora up until her rework. All of the other AD carries at least had some stint in competitive play. Trindamir had a time as a top laner in early seasons and then was pretty strong at one point with AP Trindamir. 
There was also a build for Master Yi, you may have heard of it called AP Master Yi which was so broken it had to be completely gutted out of the game. But Fiora, she didn't. No games whatsoever. Again, it's not that Fiora was so unlikable, there were players that did play the old Fiora, but the champion suffered from some serious unhealthy design. I spoke about in my last documentary how, until he eventually received a mini rework, Aatrox was Riot's most neglected champion of all time, but Fiora was honestly a close second. Let's take a look at her patch history. Her release was late February of 2012. On the next patch, two weeks later, she got a bug fix. After that, she had several months of being pathetically bad, so she got a cooldown decrease on her R. Great. At the beginning of Season 3, on patch 1.0.0.153, she got a very small buff, which was honestly more of a bug fix. On 3.11, she again got another quality of life change, which is helpful, but not the biggest deal in the world. On 3.15, she got a bug fix. On 4.1, she got a bug fix. On 4.4, she got a bug fix. On 4.5, wow, a buff of 4 armor. Okay, great, it's been more than 2 years now of being terrible, so she finally got a buff to her early game. Okay, maybe Fiora's gonna be good soon. But then, on patch 4.20, for whatever reason, Fiora got like a net neutral change which was sort of a nerf in other ways, so I guess 4 base armor was just too OP, too much to ask for. And that's it. That is literally it for all her changes. She would then be reworked the next year on patch 5.15, so she was out for more than three entire years and she got two small buffs, a net neutral change that was basically a nerf, and a few bug fixes. Talk about a champion that Riot really doesn't want to be good. Riot's ultimate goal with her rework was to make her viable in some capacity. Don't leave the champion to be terrible for years and years on end. Give her the tools to outplay her opponents. Let the pros express some skill on her. And somebody, please pick her in a competitive match. And to their credit, they achieved exactly what they set out to do. Get in the fight, man! No one attacks down yet. The boomerang goes out, knocked enough by a slow. Wow, Morin! And that's the beautiful play! That's a double! Yeah, what an outplay! And SKT demolish H2K! Try to do down on the turret. Well, Grand Challenge is up now. Oh dear. Uh oh, Warlock taken out pretty oh. easily again. Oh, right Jeez. after the flash, too. Limits what you could do with it, what is good. Yeah, more so just the confidence that Bang has it in Wolf 2. Well, yeah, Warren, Warren taking a tower hit. Bengi's actually flashed forward. The Volatile Spidling comes up. Grand Challenge is available. Ziv gets the heal from Decimate, but it's not enough! Morin's Grand Challenge is success. Fiora's new abilities and kit was leaked in the summer of 2015, and the rework launched very soon after. Immediately, the design choices leap out at your screen. Fiora's Riposte was now a real ability, a true defensive ability, and the fact that you could not only slow their attack speed, but also reflect crowd control onto your target was a fresh idea that perfectly aligned with her thematic. Her passive received a full overhaul, and while it's still built and sustained into her kit, this approach introduced us to Vitals. These vitals have had quite the lifespan in League of Legends. They are one of the more cool mechanics in the game, but also one of the most frustrating. For the Fiora player, there are a lot of bugs attached to these vitals, making it counterintuitive to play and use correctly, but for the players playing against Fiora, sometimes the randomness of their location on your body did feel really bad to play against, since it's such a significant help to Fiora in a 1v1 to proc vital after vital after vital. To this day, it's been somewhat remedied, as the code has been reworked and cleaned up, and now more often than not, it's easy to know where the next vital will be because it usually just flips to the opposite side, but from what I understand, it's still pretty buggy. Her new E kept along the same attack speed theme, but now for only two auto attacks. However, you get a guaranteed crit on the second one, so if you get off both auto attacks, you're instantly rewarded. Her kit and build now resembled much more of a fighter than a true melee carry, with building items like Black Cleaver, Guardian Angel, Spirit Visage, and Death's Dance becoming way more normal rather than Infinity Edge and Crit. Ravenous Hydra is still core to this day and has almost always been an item that she has loved, but with her new Q applying on hit effects and the champion now loving cooldown reduction, this paved the way for Fiora to try building Trinity Force, which is now also a staple item. 
Also, this is totally off key and not at all objective, but I really feel like they ruined the Royal Guard skin with this rework. Do you guys agree with me? I mean, this used to be one of my favorite skins in the game, but now it's one of her worst skins. I don't know, she just looks weird. But you know what? At least she has really nice skins nowadays, so I guess I can't complain too much. Towards the end of Season 5, we got the World Championship. However, this would end up being one of Riot's biggest screw-ups ever. It was laughable what they did. For whatever reason, they decided to just blow up the meta and introduce six brand new reworks, tons of balance changes, and new items right before the tournament started. Fiora, along with Gangplank and the Juggernauts, were no exception to this. Even though they knew that her kit would be much better, that really wasn't the question. The question was how much better was Fiora? Well, the pros answered that question very quickly because Fiora was OP. In general, she was never hit as hard as the others were, and it really showed, because Fiora's peak came right along the years of 2016 and 2017, as she cemented herself as the best top laner in the game for most of those seasons, and even during some of that time, she was probably the single strongest champion in the game. In fairness to Fiora, it's not just that she was strong, but also the meta was perfect for her. This was during the height of the tank meta in Season 6 and Season 7, and because you were mostly playing against tanks every game, that really allowed Fiora to shine. Fighters and bruisers in general were pretty bad, but she had the best chance by far to deal with the tanks, as she's always been an excellent pick into tanks. At the time, we suffered from the likes of Tank Echo top lane, Maokai, and Poppy. These champions would build Iceborne Gauntlet, Sunfire Cape, and Grasp of the Undying, and were completely unkillable for any other bruiser. If you even dared to try champions like Riven or Renekton into these tanks, you had no hope of killing them after one item, and they would start killing you and dive you under your tower on two items. Fiora, though, could easily repost Echo's W. She could definitely deal with Maokai and outclass him, but sometimes the poppy player could still smash her. Keep these small edges. Yeah, if I wow, haunts it. Yeah, I mean, oh, and he stops again. Brutalizing Moody right now. Again, just shade stunning him. Dear Lord, haunts her. Smashes Hootie. This was also during the time that NA teams started to import a lot of Korean top laners such as Someday and Flame, and these guys would set the bar extremely high for the standard of Fiora play in the NALCS. They would really show up the competition. There was also another Korean top laner who was relatively unknown at the time, but would put himself on the map because of his insane Fiora play, and his name was Khan. I would say of anybody's Fiora that I've seen, Khan might be right up there in the argument for being the best. He shows what true mastery of this champion looks like, and he's pulled off some of the craziest things we've ever seen at the highest level. Because of her sheer domination over the top lane, Fiora would be nerfed into the ground for months on end. The champion though didn't want to die, and tanks were still prevalent, so she continued to be strong. However, it all ended for Fiora on patch 7.14, which was the last nerf that we've ever seen for her. This was released on July 19th, 2017, so it's been more than two years since we've seen any nerfs to Fiora. The hit to her ultimate completely losing its movement speed was a bigger change than you might expect at first. The amount of movement speed lost alone on your passive made it difficult to proc your vitals and dance around your targets, not really letting Fiora be the champion that she's supposed to be. However, losing that during Grand Challenge entirely introduced a lot of counterplay to her kit. This movement speed made her so strong before because it allowed her to dive people under tower with ease by swinging in and out of the tower aggro. They would partially buff this back on patch 7.16 after many complaints from the Fiora players that this patch literally killed the champ. But there was something interesting. On patch 7.18, Riot would completely revert their change and buff what was lost on Fiora. So at this point, you're probably thinking that Fiora is just going to go right back to being top tier then. If you think that, you would then be wrong, because Fiora had a problem, and it was one item, not even a completed item, but just a component that would completely negate a lot of the champion's power. This was the introduction of Bramble Vest. On patch 7.14, the same one as the original Fiora nerf, we would be introduced to a new reworked Thornmail, subsequently a new component called Bramble Vest. For only 900 gold, you were given 35 armor, the ability to reflect damage onto your attacker, and then apply Grievous Wounds. 
which, if you know anything about Fiora, seems like Riot essentially created an item to counter her. After Bramble Vest was introduced, Fiora would be dropped down not one or two notches on the tier list, but more like four or five. Tanks, and more specifically the ones that built Bramble Vest, would clobber the top lane meta and bruisers for the rest of Season 7. Eventually, Bramble Vest would be nerfed directly and tanks themselves would be nerfed too, so you really think that it would be time for Fiora to come back once we got to Season 8. And with the introduction of a new rune for bruisers, that being Conqueror, you really think it would be time for her to shine. This however, was not the case. Because up until recently, Conqueror had true damage, a lot of its power budget, meaning how much power it can have, was really tied into that true damage. This was not only redundant for Fiora, as the champion already has true damage, but it would also kill off all of the tanks in the meta. As we saw in Season 6 and Season 7, Fiora thrives in the tank metas, being the prototypical fighter that can cut them down. Being honest though, for most of Season 8, and honestly most of Season 9, she was really, really bad. Other bruisers were stronger, like Jax, Riven, and Renekton, and tanks were non-existent. If you take a look at her buff since late Season 7, it's pretty crazy. She's been buffed almost 10 times since then. Which brings us to today. For Season 10, Conquer has now been reworked, and it acts very similarly to the way that Fervor of Battle used to. On top of that, a huge portion of its power was removed with the loss of true damage, but instead converted into more healing. And this alone is a monster change for Fiora. This means with the loss of true damage, tanks are back in action, with champions like Orin making a full comeback this preseason, but Fiora also received a ton of buffs last year because of how bad she was. Riposte is now a 2 second hard CC on Reflection, which is GG for most fighters. If Riven ever third Qs right onto Fiora, she's as good as dead. On top of that, Fiora has now made her name as not only the best 1v1 split pusher in the late game, but she's now the fastest tower killer in the game too. She received two direct buffs to her tower pushing. Her Q now procs on towers, which is not only great for Sheen, but it also reduces the cooldown, and her E crit works on the tower. For Season 10, take Conqueror Fiora with Demolish in the Resolve Tree secondary, and watch yourself start 1v9 in games. She's easily an S tier top laner these days. I asked the Fiora mains what their favorite part of the champion is, and what they like about her. I think the thing that draws people to play Fiora the most these days is pretty nicely summed up by a response from Scorpio13. Because of her riposte, Fiora can turn almost any lane into a skill matchup. She can outplay almost anybody. Even if the matchup is unfavorable, for example, if the jungler tries to gank you and CC you, there's a chance you could riposte it, turn it around, and get a double kill. Fiora is the best split pusher in the game, and it's just fun to dance around, proc vitals, and 1v1 people. Even though she isn't a very good team fighter like other fighters, that's in the name of balance, or at least you would hope. As a champion who late game can 1v2 your side laners, she's always a fun pick to watch. You never know if a pro is going to go ham on Fiora and win the game by himself in the side lane. You never know what kind of backdoor nonsense that you'll see from her, and that really keeps the top lane role exciting and important. To be honest, I don't think she's the most balanced or even the most fair champion in the game. Not by a long shot. However, she's clearly one of the most fun and most rewarding champions in the game. And there's something to say about that too. That's going to do it for today's documentary. If you enjoyed, press like and subscribe, and I will see you all next time.